Today on The Novelizers, comedian Veer Doss, Criminal Minds Paget Brewster, plus Seth Herzog and intern Kevin Carter. Now here's your host, Andy Richter. In the mid-90s, a young studio exec at 20th Century Fox had a crazy idea. What if we made a typical alien invasion disaster movie, but named it Independence Day so that history teachers across America could deduct their ticket price from their taxable income as a legitimate business expense? The plan paid off, raking in over $800 million, or as Fox told the writers, lost 25 bucks. And speaking of writers, we got some great ones to turn that movie into a book, which is what this podcast is all about. Now here's my intern, Kevin Carter, to catch us up on the story so far. Uh, yeah, so the Earth is surrounded by alien spaceships. And the only one who seems to realize that it's a bad thing is Jeff Goldblum. Fortunately, Goldblum's ex works at the White House. So he goes there to convince the president to take bold action like, well, I don't, I don't know, he never, he never really says. Anyway... Will Smith is a fighter pilot who is bummed out because he's been rejected by NASA. And that's not really a bad thing during an alien invasion. And America sends a helicopter with a light panel to communicate with the aliens, thinking this is more of a close encounters of the third kind type situation. Thank you, Kevin. Our next chapter was novelized by Twitter superstar Maura Quint and narrated by comedian Verdas. Verdas, novelize me. Chapter 7, Come Sail Away, novelized by Maura Quint, narrated by Veer Das. Okay, wait a second. Wait a second. Let's pause this tale for a minute and say that there were massive spaceships right now, just hovering metal tins of Jiffy Pop hanging out over the tallest buildings of one of the most major cities in the world. And right now, let's say that for some reason, maybe hard work, or more likely ass-licking a bunch of billionaires, you were the president the one person who had to decide what to do about this. Do you think you'd decide we should send up some giant looking police helicopters to flash a bunch of bright disorienting police lights at them in close range? Or do you think maybe if the aliens had heard about I Love Lucy and Rihanna and the general existence of Earth, they'd also at this point heard that ACAB? I'm just asking questions. Anyway, so President Bill Pullman has sent something he's calling the welcome wagon to go irritate the aliens and flash a bunch of stadium lights in their faces and the helicopters have gone. President Pullman hurries back to Central Command. General Gray, coordinate with the Atlantic Command. Tell them to evacuate as many people out of the cities as they can and get those helicopters away from the ship. Call them back immediately. What the hell is going on? Demands tall middle-aged character who you definitely know from like a million other movies and whose name will absolutely come back to me in a minute. Oh fuck, I know. He was on Law and Order. But that doesn't narrow it down, does it? Okay, he's real thin, you know, like not quite an Ichabod Crane level. But like imagine Ichabod Crane had a younger brother who fucked. Okay, sorry, where were we? We're leaving, President Pullman commands. Kim, my daughter! Kim pauses. Her? But in the air, a space oddity was brewing. The helicopter pilot radios, Oh, there's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. As a crack widens in the ship, opening and emanating a blue light that no matter what color a theorist might tell you, is not in any way calming. The group command shares with the room. It looks like it might be some kind of response. They're not leaving us on red. I repeat, they're not leaving us on red. And in that instance, the aliens blew up their phone. I mean, helicopter, big huge fireballs in the sky hurtling to the ground. And that's when they knew this insurrection attempt was serious. So the president hustles out the door, staffers hurrying, tapping their earpieces in chaos. We're evacuating! I repeat, we're evacuating! Several interns think about how they could have been in their hometown, making out with their high school crush behind the Dairy Queen. But everyone said a DC internship would be so valuable and not one person said, hey, sometimes aliens are going to attack and isn't that always the bullshit? President Pullman, General Robert Logier, Dr. Ian Malcolm, and his dad, Judd Hirsch, load into the Air Force One helicopter. Is my wife in the air? Asked the president. She will be shortly, General Logier responds, despite his obviously making that up because social media didn't exist then. So how the hell would he know what anyone was doing or eating at any minute? Judd Hirsch just kind of admires the surroundings, noting, we have our own phone. 
Because sure, there are fireballs and mayhem and destruction and the threat of the end of the world, but he knows how to enjoy a moment, a centered and present king. Dr. Ian Malcolm, however, is noting on his high-tech laptop countdown clock that there are only nine minutes left before something. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, the First Lady is packing her room as hotel staff neatly fold clothes because aliens may be terrifying for a moment, but being seen as unstyled is forever. Secret Service announces, the President is ordering we leave now. As the First Lady pauses in front of a fuzzy TV, the 24-hour news cycle is just really that hypnotic. Our weak and degrading infrastructure cannot handle the mass exodus from the cities and cars are stopping on all of the freeways leaving metropolitan areas, which, dear listener, perhaps seemed interesting and imaginative to late 20th century American audiences who still lived with the belief that catastrophic horrors couldn't really happen to them. It was a simpler, stupider time where the lyrics of one of the biggest hit songs simply said, come on, ride the train, it's a choo-choo, whatever. Vivica A. Fox is one of the people stuck in her car, trying to escape with her son and dog. The radio announces, people are advised to avoid the highways wherever possible. And she mutters, oh yeah, now he tells me. As though that's new information and has not been said every single day on Los Angeles radio before and since this moment. Now the LA spaceship hovers over the US bank tower in downtown because aliens are anti-capitalist despite having some bad traits. People dance on the roof, holding signs, hoping to be discovered by intergalactic talent agents calling occupants of intergalactic craft. Helicopters shout through bullhorns ordering the people to leave as Vivica A. Fox's co-worker Tiffany arrives and runs to the center of the roof. Look, the New York traffic is just as bad, even though for some reason, the people who move from New York to LA always complain about the traffic. Harvey Firestein is stuck in it, the traffic, and is calling his therapist. The receptionist answers and tells him he's not in, because right now we all still have to do our jobs, even when the world is ending. There's no alien or apocalypse days off, and you didn't foresee the future enough to put in vacation time, so hey, here you are, answering phones for minimum wage, as the earth barely clings to existence, and the meaninglessness of it hovers still blurry in front of your face. Anyway, for $300 an hour, you can put me through to his house in the Hamptons. Harvey quips. The chaos builds. The first lady is escorted into Air Force Two. She watches the crowd of people still dancing on the rooftop, singing the subterranean homesick blues before stepping into the helicopter. First lady secure, we're on the move. Tiffany, on the rooftop, looks up and gleefully shouts, they're opening up. She's mesmerized, smiling. It's so pretty, as the bottom of the spacecraft resembles like an arcade claw game about to scoop up all the revelers in LA and the Empire State Building in New York. People in the city leave their cars, mesmerized by the sight, staring at it like idiots, because nobody knew that every experience was better if you filmed the entirety of it on your phone yet. We wouldn't learn that for another decade at least. The aliens made sure to arrive just before they could be really documented because no matter who or what you are in the galaxy, no one likes when unflattering pics of them are posted online. In DC, the president and his team run from the helicopter to Air Force One plane and buckle in. Dr. Ian Malcolm looks at his computer. Time's up. The spacecraft opening begins to gather a laser as though it's about to put on the most awesome Pink Floyd light show ever, concentrated over and then exploding the LA building. The fire and the force exploding buildings, throwing cars, really just eating through that special effects budget in seconds. The Empire State Building is next and everyone runs. Now, cultural note for the reader, at this moment in the 20th century American culture, much like Tamagotchi's and Doc Martens, treating an NYC skyscraper blowing up and watching people run for their lives as entertainment was the fashion at the time. Also of note, Harvey Firestein watches the NY destruction from his car as another car hurtles towards him because having a gay-coded character was progressive, but letting them survive an apocalypse movie was, of course, you know, a bridge too far. Finally, Back in DC, the White House explodes faster than you can say tax breaks for corporations. The explosion taking down the nearest helicopter. A massive, destructive fireball moves outwards in a circle, destroying each of these cities. People scream, vehicles are thrown, and the world for a moment may be ending. Air Force One takes off, just barely ahead of the billowing fire cloud, headed, we can only guess. 
Thanks. And now here's my intern, Kevin Carter, who interviewed one of the fine folks who worked on the film Independence Day. All right, how's it going, everybody? I'm Kevin Carter, and this is the interview portion. I'm here today with Reginald Thompson, who is the gaff curator for the movie Independence Day. Reginald, how's it going? Do you mind if I call you Reggie? Can I call you Reggie? You can call me Reggie. Yeah, you can call me Tommy. You can call me Reggie Tommy. Whatever works for you. Totally right. fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with Reg. I think Reg, Reg is cool. perfect. Reg is cool. Exactly. You Reg, only how's capitalize it, how's... the G. <laughs> only, exactly. How's it small going Small R, small E. It's going great today. I'm really excited to talk to you about some, I think, Independence Day was some of my best work. So right. um, could you please inform the, the audience on, on what yeah. a gaff curator is? I create what people call the gaffes, which is like the mistakes in a movie. Everyone thinks these things are mistakes. Like when someone's in a one shirt and then it cuts to the other actor and it cuts back and they're in a totally different shirt. Everyone's like, that's a crazy mistake. The wardrobe should have caught that. No, 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 no. They are magic moments and Easter eggs created by people like me. We have a union. There's a whole bunch of us who work in LA and, and, and uh, New York to make this happen. We're there to create little magic moments for the audience and the real fans. So this this is interesting because, you know, most people look at those as mistakes. But to hear that, you know, this was done on purpose, it gives people a more reason to go back and watch the movie. And exactly. You're a very yeah, yeah. important person, sir. You're I'm a very, very important, important person. person. We do pre-production for like, I'm going to say nine to ten months before each film to really figure out what magic moments we're going to create. And we try to do one or two for each scene. And in Independence Day, we really nailed it. They let us do, the director and the producers were like, you know, this is big budget. We can do as much as we want. We have unlimited budget. So let's really make these mistakes big and like noticeable. Let's not be too subtle here. What defines like a good gaff? You know, something like, what, what defines that? Well, we want one that's like noticeable, but not too noticeable. Like there's some that are super small that you have to go back and really know, notice it. And there's some that are like, what just happened? And you don't quite... You don't quite know what happened, but you realize something's off. We don't quite know what's off. And then you have to go back and kind of figure out what's off. But like you're just feeling uneasy. That's what we're going for. We want the audience to feel uneasy in every scene, but not know why. Could you give us an example? Could, could you give an example sure. of one? Um, the there's, I mean, yeah, there's a bunch. There's a lot that we did in uh, Independence Day. There's one when uh, Jeff Goldblum and his ex-girlfriend Connie are arguing in their kitchen. And he opens the fridge and there's like milk carton, several bottles of beer and some other boxes. And he closes the door and then she opens the door a minute later and there's nothing in the fridge. It's completely empty. Like, like really, that, that's really happened. Yeah, we did that. We curated that, that moment. We, we put it in, we put all the stuff in. And then before we they cut back to the fridge, we said cut and we took everything out. And when she opens the fridge, it's completely empty. We're like, this is just a magic moment. How do you do this to draw people in to watch the movie as opposed to them not Getting, pulling them out? I, yeah. That's the thing. A lot of people, it draws them in in certain ways, but not in the way you want. Not in the way you want. It doesn't keep them focused on the plot or the characters or the storyline. It just keeps them focusing on, are these mistakes on purpose? They seem so crazy that no one would notice. They kind of have to be on purpose. And that's where I come in. That's where the art comes in. The art is like, how obvious can we make it? So people are like, there's no way they just forgot that. Like, now I got a question for you. I heard yep. that um, I, I did my research on, on a gaffer. So I, I tried to mm -hmm. do a little bit better with this interview thing. You know, say mm -hmm. Andy's proud. I heard that some people can look at your job mm -hmm. as gaslighting the audience. Mm. Like you're, you're making them, you they they know what they see, but you're saying, no, everything's fine. Every, nothing's wrong. Everything's right. fine. Right, right, right. They see how one you, thing and then they that? see another two seconds later and they're like, what exactly. was real? Mm -hmm. What's really there? What's really there for the storyline? Is that thing supposed to be there or is it not mm -hmm. supposed to be there? And it comes back again. Like some things are gone and they, they come back again. Like when Will Smith ejects out of the plane, He's clearly attached to his seat, right? Which was a lot of heavy prop work. Yes. But then when he lands, the seat's nowhere near him. It's not even close. But then we, we talk, cut to another shot and we see the seat like three feet near him. So it goes away, comes back, it goes away, it comes back. Who knows what the reality is? Is this whole thing in Will's head? Is he dreaming the whole thing? We don't know. This is amazing. 
Um, I always thought like, um, you know, saying anybody can be a gaffer, right? Anybody can be a gaffer, yeah. you know? Well, by a gaffer, you mean like someone who works on like the lighting. Oh, that's okay. the real job of a gaffer. Okay. We don't call what we do gaffers because it's too close to what the other job is. Uh huh. You see what I'm saying? Like people yeah. will get confused. Yeah. You know, so we're like um, a gaff expert, or I like to say I'm a magician. And I create magic. You know what? Moments. I am or, so glad you or said I'm that. Or I'm just a chicken who makes Easter eggs. So does this job like ever get out of control to where it's like some people, they do their job and it's like sometimes they take their job home and, and, and it doesn't relate to everybody. You know, is, is, right. there, is everything OK? Like anything bad happened to you by at being home? so good at what you do? Yes, at home. I'm so good at it. Doesn't make, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like sometimes I'm so good at it. People don't even know that it's happening. Like. I I got for once to uh, to prank my wife. I got a tattoo of my face on my face. It's like a perfect recreation of my face, but it was a tattoo. She never noticed. That's commitment. She didn't that, notice that, that, that it was commitment. a perfect tattoo. It was exactly as my face. Did you did you ever tell her? No. Oh wow! And then I had it removed. I like the idea of what you do, you know, mm -hmm. because um mm -hmm. I haven't told anybody this, but uh you know I'm I got a, a screenplay that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's called uh Aha Made You Look, you oh. know, and um it's all about you know it's in deception, right? You know, um right. and, and I, I would love to, you know, so you look at it one day and just to just to read it, just see if it's like I'd oh I could, I could I could I could do some things there. I'd love to read enough to see what you've put in already and where you can where we could go from there. And that that'd be great. You know, I'm just I'm just trying to make it, you know. I'm just trying I'm just, I just need yeah. a shot, you know. I Sometimes I'll, I'll give there. myself a shout out in the film. Really? Like uh in this movie, there are these two British soldiers. And when it when the camera cuts to them, they're clearly wearing name tags. That one says Gills Hearn and Alec Kinsley. But then when you go to the credits, they're listed as Reginald and Thomas. That's me. That's Reginald hilarious. Reginald Thomas. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, yep. before we before we get off of here, yeah. What's what else is going on in Reg's life that people that people can look up or follow you on? I'm I'm heading heavily back into the prank world. You know, I'm a producing consultant on a prank panel, I'm doing a lot of work with a lot of like YouTube creators on uh, their pranks and stuff. Like it's mostly a lot of pushing old people into traffic. But yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of like YouTube work with a lot of, you know, inf influencers pranking their friends. Like I'm, I'm, I came up with the idea of like greasing the floor and then you wake them out of bed and startle them, and then they come out and slip on the floor. That was all. That was all me. Yeah, that sounded like classic Home Alone stuff. Classic right stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I want to thank you for uh, joining us today, everybody. This has been Reg. I am Kevin Carter. Please enjoy the rest of the podcast. Thank you, Kevin. You've changed my worldview forever. Our next chapter was novelized by comedian and writer Josh Gondelman from last week with John Oliver and Jesus and Mero and narrated by the amazingly talented Paget Brewster, star of Friends and Criminal Minds. Paget, novelize me. Chapter 8, Rubble, Rubble, Toil and Trouble. Novelized by Josh Gondelman. Narrated by Paget Brewster. By late on July 2nd, traffic in Los Angeles was slightly worse than usual, in that it was moving at the same speed, but there were also explosions happening. Jasmine saw the writing on the wall, and that writing said, get the hell out of your car before it explodes too. Oh my God, come on, Dylan, Jasmine said, hopping out of the driver's side door. If there was one thing she hated, it was being on fire. If there were two things, the second would be how much of a pain in the ass it would be for her son to be on fire. Jasmine hoisted Dylan onto her hip. His Reebok baseball cap sat backwards on his head, making him look like an adorable little Andre Agassi. Only in this case, he'd never make it to 15 without the love of his mother helping him escape the flaming wreckage of Los Angeles. Jasmine ran to a door along the side of the tunnel. Oh yeah, they were in a tunnel. Marked maintenance, even though she didn't especially wish to maintain the current state of affairs. She kicked in the door, which made her feel briefly like a golden goddess. Golden, shoot, Boomer. Boomer is dog, in case you don't remember. Boomer, she called. Boomer! 
In the nick of time, Boomer hopped out of Jasmine's car and ran towards her. As he made his final bound through the maintenance doorway, an explosion behind him propelled him the last several feet. It was kind of like when that happens to Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible, a movie that came out only two months earlier, so it must have been a case of parallel thinking. Boomer landed safely inside the maintenance closet just in time for the room's single light bulb to explode, plunging the trio into darkness. Just Jasmine's luck. She'd really been hoping to make some progress on the new John Grisham novel before bed. The sun rose on July 3rd, which was not a given, considering the previous night's events. As dawn spread across the New York City skyline like the coffee a roommate spilled on a couch cushion they never even offered to pay to replace, the Statue of Liberty's normal spot within it was conspicuously empty. Instead, Lady L lay toppled over in the Hudson River like a warning to other statues, upended, but poking out far enough to make you wonder if the river is less deep than you'd previously thought. In the sky above, a spacecraft blotted out the horizon. For a vehicle of that size to have knocked over the Statue of Liberty without destroying it completely demonstrates a level of precision normally seen only in the barbers who line up designated hitters' beards. These aliens were no slouches. Simultaneously, in a state most New York City residents could not point to on a map, retired fighter pilot Russell Cass drove his RV down a dusty highway. His sons, Troy and Miguel, were there too because you can't really jump out of a moving RV. Good God, I've been saying it! I've been saying it for ten damn years! Cass shouted. He had been claiming for a decade that he was abducted by aliens, and finally the destruction of several major cities sort of vindicated him. Or maybe this was a different thing entirely. But Cass didn't consider that, as he continued driving drunk like people do in Montana or Colorado or wherever the hell he was. He felt psyched. Troy Cass, visibly less psyched, was about to puke. Pull over, man! He yelled, the illness inside him making him bold enough to order his dad around. Well, nobody but Russell Cass yaks in Russell Cass's RV, so he pulled over to the side of the road. Troy shot out of the passenger side door like, well, the vomit that was shooting out of his mouth. Miguel and Russell rushed after him. But, like, what were they going to do? Catch the barf in their hands? I'm going to be all right! Troy said, while puking. Toxic masculinity starts so young. Just admit you're sick, little dude. Who do you think you're fooling? Everyone can see and hear and smell you throwing up. Accept care. You deserve it. Anyway, that's maybe more about me than about him. Miguel, look at that! Russell shouted, pointing out in the distance towards an encampment of several mobile homes. Great! thought Miguel, more of this guy's peers. That's exactly what I'm looking for during the apocalypse. Meanwhile, Air Force One continued to fly through the sky, which seems like maybe the worst place to be during an alien invasion. But what do I know? Patricia, the first daughter, slept peacefully across the kind of leather seat a doctor might have in his, or her, women could be doctors in 1996, car. President Whitmore looked out the window, presumably towards outer space, for which he had recently developed a powerful hatred. We could have evacuated those cities hours ago, President Whitmore said in a tone I'm not quite confident enough in my vocabulary to describe as rueful. That's the advantage of being a fighter pilot. In the Gulf War, we knew what we had to do. It's just not that simple anymore. A lot of people died today. Many didn't have to. You know a situation is bad when you're comparing it unfavorably to an American military intervention in the Middle East. Wishing something were as smooth and simple as the Gulf War is kind of a red flag that things are not going well for you. Also, did he think people didn't die in the Gulf War? Come on, man. What were you shooting your airplane guns and bombs at? 
grow up, and take responsibility for your actions, Mr. President. And keep in mind, 9-11 hadn't even happened yet, so the American public wasn't yet super on board with killing whoever in Iraq based on whatever pretenses. Any news on my wife? The president asked, hoping she didn't die, presumably because she's from America. Helicopter never made it to Dulles. No radio contact. The president's face fell. Unfortunately, he was one of the presidents who would have been sad if his wife disappeared. Not like JFK or Bill Clinton or Abe Lincoln. Obviously, you can't get a divorce when you're the president, but being widowed by an extraterrestrial invasion? That's an infinite hall pass. Goodbye, Mary Todd. Hello, Harry Bods. That's what Lincoln would have said under these circumstances. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, Jasmine and Dylan emerged from the rubble only to find more rubble as far as the eye could see. Fires had popped up all over L.A., like restaurants that only sell bacon-wrapped Brussels sprout pops or some other shit that's more for the Instagram photo than to eat. Obviously, Instagram didn't exist yet, but Jasmine didn't make that observation. The narrator did, and I, the narrator, exist in the present. The city was desolate abandoned, even more so than when every single entertainment executive goes on vacation from Thanksgiving until Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and then again from Memorial Day until Labor Day. Flames licked at the bases of palm trees. The air had taken on a sickly yellow hue, like a dying Simpson. Honestly, by the 2020s, this kind of sight would have become industry standard thanks to climate change. But in 1996, it was still extremely jarring. What happened, Mommy? Dylan asked. I don't know, baby, Jasmine replied, as if she would have any more information than he did. Did he not remember that she had spent the night in the same pitch-black tunnel maintenance closet as him? Use your noodle, kiddo. Mother and son took in the barren vista laid out before them. Who of their friends and loved ones survived the night, they wondered. What will the future look like? Is that good brunch place on Fairfax still open? These were the questions weighing on their minds. The dog, being stupid, was totally fine. Back in a dimly lit Air Force base at Area 51, crack a window, why don't you, the Air Force? Major Mitchell laid out his plans for the first wave of a counterattack against the sky. Good luck with that. Miller's subordinates chatted as he spoke, like C students with rich parents. You scared man? Captain Jimmy Wilder asked Captain Stephen Hiller. Nope. You? Nope. Wilder replied. He then collapsed exaggeratedly into Hiller's arms, whimpering, Hold me! To these men, it would have been gay to fear death and embarrassing to be gay. Hey, pay attention, Hiller said, heterosexually. Major Mitchell, noticing the extremely obvious distraction, asked if Hiller had anything to share with the group, because apparently Air Force majors talk like easily annoyed Boy Scout troop leaders. No, sir, just excited to get up there and whoop E.T.'s ass, he said, as confidently as if he weren't up against an intergalactic military force, the likes of which humankind had never seen before and could barely comprehend, and was instead plotting to, I don't know, just throwing this out there, walk up to Chris Rock and slap him in the face. You'll get your chance. You'll all get your chance. Major Mitchell said, in a tone that felt more threatening than encouraging, which makes sense. Unlike Steve and Jimmy, Captain Hiller realized that the U.S. military would likely prove no match for an alien force that had already somehow ascertained the cultural significance of several U.S. landmarks and pulverized them to gravel. Let's kick the tires and light the fires, Jimmy said. You could tell he really wanted to start that being kind of a thing people would say. You know, like before a big business meeting or a sporting event. That would be so rad, Jimmy thought, if his thing caught on. Maybe if he stopped the world from being blown up by space guys, it would. Thanks, Paget. That's all the top-notch literature we have time for today. Kevin, land this spaceship. Thanks, Andy. And thanks to this week's guest contributors. 
Moore Quint, Veer Das, Josh Gondelman, Seth Herzog, and Paget Brewster. More info about all of our guests can be found in the show description. The Novelizers was created by Stephen Levison, produced by Stephen, Chris Karwowski, Rob Kudner, and Suchetis Bokil. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Chris. Improv booking by Christine Bullen. Music by Cole Imhoff. Art direction by Crystal Dennis with illustrations by Barry Crane. Intro narration by Robin Reed. Interviews by me, Kevin Carter. Special thanks to Luke Dennis and Peter Hayes at Why Soul Public Radio in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Check out thenovelizers.com for more info about the show and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and occasionally TikTok. If you enjoy The Novelizers, please support us on Patreon or email thenovelizers at gmail.com to sponsor an episode. Till next time, I'm Kevin Carter. Novelizers out. <laughs>